from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, The Science Bag, the program where faculty members from university science departments share their special interests with you. And now, scientists who turn the world upside down. With Bart Adrian, UWM Department of Mathematical Sciences. was one weird looking dude with the hair. That guy had a case of severe hair like I have never seen. <laughs> Holy man. Somebody ought, you know what? Somebody ought to call the chancellor. Tell him there are some very peculiar people on this campus. Well, you know what? We don't have time for that. Besides, you're not supposed to have cell phones out during the show, so you know how it goes. Hey, we got a lot of scientists to talk about, a lot of interesting stuff today. And so let's get started. Oh, let's see. Anybody know what, what this contraption is called? What do you call this? Thermometer. Thermometer. Wow, we are off to a red hot start. You are going to be a sharp audience, I can already tell. Yes, this is a thermometer. You know what? This is arguably one of the greatest inventions in the history of science. It is so simple and yet so elegant. Look, you got a glass tube. Glass tubes don't change very much with normal temperature, but inside of it you have a liquid. In this case, it's a red liquid, an alcohol. And the distinguishing property of the alcohol is that it expands and contracts easily with normal temperature change. So when the temperature is getting warmer in the room, the alcohol climbs up in the tube, or sometimes we use the favorite liquid metal, mercury has been used in this case, and it climbs up in the tube, and you look at it against the scale, and you say, wow, it's getting warm in here. Now, given that this is one of the most incredible inventions in the history of science, Everybody knows who invented it, right? Raise your hand if you know who invented the thermometer. <laughs> Wait a minute, I don't see any takers. Ladies and gentlemen, the inventor of the thermometer, our first scientist for this evening, the incredible Galileo Galilei. Oh. Now, Galileo did a lot of things that a lot of people know about. But he was born and raised in Italy and a mathematician first, we believe that in the year 1593, Galileo really invented what is the granddaddy of the thermometer. Only this is what Galileo's thermometer looked a little bit more like. This is a thermoscope. And the way it works is you've got these balls that are of all different weights inside, and they're sitting in this water. And you know, when water, the temperature of water changes, the density of the water changes. So when the water warms up, for example, it becomes less dense, and then some of these balls will sink to the bottom. And the way it, is, it operates is that each ball is cal calibrated so that when it is at the same density of the water, it will sit kind of right in the middle at the lowest floating point, and that is the approximate temperature. So according to this, it's 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Feels like about that to be in here. So now, obviously, this does not look like your standard thermometer that I showed you, but it was the start. And without Galileo, it would not have happened. Ladies and gentlemen, think about this. When did Columbus discover America? History people, yes. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Thank you very much. Now think about it. If you were to go, going way back to the early sailing days, every good captain kept a logbook with a description of the weather at his or her ports of call. Now, 
If you were to look in Columbus's logbook on October 12, 1492, when Columbus landed in San Salvador, you will not find any record of the temperature because he would have to wait 101 years for Galileo to invent the thermometer. Amazing. Well, we're only getting started here. So let's take our first sidebar. I love sidebars. We're going to talk about, go way back a little bit before Galileo and talk about Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus, and by the way, he was born and raised in Poland, and his Polish name was Mikolai Kopernik. And in fact, you can see his name inscribed on a plaque across the hall here uh, in front of the UWM planetarium. Copernicus was a mathematician, and Copernicus took a lot of time using mathematics to try to understand the behavior of the universe and the sun and the moon and the stars. And Copernicus figured out, using mathematics alone, that there was no way that the Earth could be the center of the universe. Now, what happened? Not very much. He had a few critics, but he knew how to kind of keep it quiet. And he wasn't one of the true scientists. Although people did criticize him sometimes. I love this quote. He said, perhaps there will be babblers who, although completely ignorant of mathematics, nevertheless take it upon themselves to pass judgment on mathematical <laughs> questions and will dare find fault with my undertaking and censure it. I disregard them. <laughs> Way to tell them, Copernicus. Somebody's got to stick up for the mathematicians. All right. Now, Copernicus, though, nonetheless, was not a true modern scientist. Galileo was the first true modern scientist. Galileo understood everything about Copernicus's mathematics. But Galileo did not just stop there. He didn't just think about it in theory and then go to sleep at night. No, he tested the theory with experimentation and measurement. And the way he did it and the, what, the experimentation that he's most famous and well known for is his experimentation with the incredible telescope. Now, people will say that Galileo did or did not invent the telescope. What we believe happened was he had a friend in Holland who built this thing called a spyglass. And they were trying to keep it top secret because it was like, you know, had obvious military use uh, for spying on people. So Galileo gets a letter from his friend. And now this is where I would say it's arguable that Galileo did invent a telescope. Because, you know, in those days, he couldn't, like, get a picture of one sent to him on the Internet or ask for blueprints. No, his friend just sent, you know, a couple of paragraphs describing it. And Galileo built it himself. Unlike his friend, Galileo took his telescope in 1609 and started looking at the moon. And at first, a lot of people were really impressed with Galileo. And if he would have quit there, he would have been famous and made a lot of money and lived happily ever after. But Galileo continued to make observations. And then, then came the incredible four fateful nights in the early part of the year 1610, when Galileo turned his telescope to Jupiter. And here's where I need five volunteers. Five volunteers, please. One, two, three, four, and five. Come forward. Thank you very much. All right. You guys are going to help me out. Let's see. You are going to be, first of all, I need you to put on name tags. You're going to be Jupiter. And you guys are going to be the four moons of Jupiter, the four big moons. Europa, Io, Callisto. I love those names. And Ganymede. There we go. Now, Jupiter, you got the tough job. Come on over here, Jupiter. I want you to, and I want you all face, face the audience. Here you go. Turn, face the audience, and hold up your Jupiter. Now, we're going to follow according to the script, which is the script that Galileo followed. So let's see. On the first night that Galileo made his observations, what was it? Dateline, January 7th, 1610. OK, so here's Jupiter. And then to the left of Jupiter, I want Io. Come on over here, Io. Oh, here's one. This will help. You guys each take, this is going to be the moon, and you hold it up like this. Now, and you take this one, all right, excellent. All right, so here's the order I want you to be in the first height. So the first height, Io and Europa come right over here, and I want you to stay very close together. Touch each, touch, the, all right. And then over here on the other side, Callisto, I want you right over here. Come on, Callisto, over here. Ganymede, I want you to stay right there. Hold up the moon, Ganymede. There we go. All right, so here's Galileo. 
he sits there on the night of January 7th, and he takes a look at his telescope. He says, ah, very nice. I see, the four, I see three moons. Three moons? What? Well, he can't tell the difference between Io and Europa. They're so close together, and with his crude 30 power telescope, they look like one to him. So he thinks that he sees three moons. Callisto, Io and Europa together, and Ganymede. OK, well, that's all fine and good. So what happens? Well, now Galileo is going to do some thinking, and we switch to the next night. Dateline, January 8th, 1610. Now what happens? Well, Galileo looks outside, and he sees, Io, you stay here. Europa, you come over here on the other side of Jupiter. Callisto, you go behind Jupiter and hide. And Ganymede, you stay put where you're at. So now Galileo goes, and he looks at his telescope, and he says, ah, oh, very nice. Wait a minute. How come there's two on the other side now? And they look a little different in size, but maybe not. I don't know. So he says, all right, we'll think again. So what happens? Well, now we have a couple of cloudy nights. The darn weather gets in the way all the time, you know? It's just one of those things. All right, so here we go. We go five nights later, or dateline January 13th, 1610. Now, I want Europa, I want you over here on this side. And I want Ganymede right here. And then Io. Io, come on over here. And then over here, Callisto, you come over here way on the other side. All right, stay, no, 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 stay, stay right there, right there. All right, so now Galileo takes a look at his telescope. And what does he say? He's like, what? What's going on here? Well, for, I thought there were just three. Now there's four, and they're in this weird order. I don't know what's going on. I know, maybe it was that bad Chianti I had at the restaurant before I went and looked at it the other night. That must be it. I'm going home and going to bed. All right, so what happens? The next night, the most faithful of all nights, January 15th, 1610. All right, Io, you stay put. Europa, where are, no, I'm sorry. Io, you come over here on this side. Europa, you come over here on this side next to Io. Ganymede, you're going to be just here. Callisto, you're on the far right. OK. No, 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 this, right where you were. Excellent. Thank you very much. Galileo takes a look, and he says, oh my gosh. All right. Now Galileo is convinced. Either he is having a complete out-of-body religious experience, or there is a simple, inescapable fact that Copernicus must be right. Because how else can you explain, in the old Ptolemaic view, as we called it, of the universe, where everything went around the sun, everything, the sun and the moon and the stars, the planets went around the earth, everything would have to just be moving across the sky from left to right. And instead, they're reversing order and sometimes disappearing. And the only way to explain it was that the moons were going around Jupiter. And if the moons are going around Jupiter, isn't it possible that the Earth is going around the sun and all kinds of other possibilities? Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So given all these wonderful findings, what happens? Well, we all know the story. Galileo began defending the heliocentric view of Copernicus, the idea that the sun was the center of the solar system. And what happened? Now Galileo gets in a heap of trouble because now he's really upsetting the apple cart. He's completely changing and turning upside down the way that everybody traditionally looked at the universe. And unlike Copernicus, who could only explain things by his thoughts and his math, Galileo could tell anybody, hey, buddy, look at my telescope. And he'd look at it and say, oh, yeah, Galileo, you're right. So Galileo was really in a lot of trouble. But as we know, Galileo was later vindicated. What's not known by a lot of folks is that Galileo continued to experiment in so many different ways in so many areas of science. And I think one of his very significant findings later on in life, four years before he died, is that in the year 1638, Galileo demonstrated that the air has weight. Does the air have weight? You better believe it. Every square inch of my skin, your skin, your skin, your skin, and yours has almost 15 pounds of weight on top of it. In fact, OK, this is one atmosphere. This is almost 15 pounds. Put out your hand. OK, now feel that. What, you can't hold that up? That's the amount of weight that's on every square inch of your skin. That is amazing. We should be walking around saying, oh, the air is heavy on me today. <laughs> well, actually, we used to say that in the 1970s, but you know, that's, 
that's another story. All right. So Galileo figures out that the air has weight. Now, along with that, I should tell you uh, another little sidebar, if you will. Um, Galileo had an excellent graduate student, Evangelista Torricelli. I love that name. Also lived in Italy. And Torricelli did a lot of work with Galileo in his later uh, years in the experimentation and the demonstration of the fact that the air has weight. So Torricelli was really Galileo's best graduate student and assistant. Now, Torricelli was, not, was a mathematician. He was not as brilliant as Galileo, but he had a keen mind. And he said, you know what, Galileo? I'm going to build a, a way to measure the weight of the air. And so what did he do? He invented the barometer in 1643. What is a barometer? It measures the weight of the air. It comes from the Greek word baros, which means weight. So a barometer is a meter for measuring the baros, or the weight of the air on top of us. Now, Torricelli, just so you know that science isn't perfect and everybody has to have false starts, um, Torricelli started out with this idea of using water to measure air pressure. And the idea is that you have a, a tub of water, and you take this tube, and you fill it with water, and then you turn it upside down, and you're going to have a little bit of an evacuated area on the top. And the weight, or the pressure of the air, will hold up a column of water 33.8 feet. So you know what? I thought this would be really cool. Let's put, size up and build a Torricelli barometer right here in this room. I need six volunteers. We've got to do a little measuring here. Uh, let's see. Uh, you three right there, uh, way up there. Come on down. That's four and five and six. Come on down. All right, real quick. So uh, first two, I want you to hold these. Hold these right up here against the wall like this. No, no, just him. Two at a time. Turn, take, stand right there with me. Great. All right. Now the rest of you come and you pair up and you hold yours up just like that. There, you take those two. You take these two. You take these two. There you go. You're going to have to move down a little bit, I think. There we go. And we need what? Where's my other volunteer? Who's missing? But no, no, no. Each person has two. There you go. All right. So let's get and let's do them black and white. We got to keep in touch with school colors, right? So there's all right. There we go. Yellow and black, I should say. There you go. All right. Hold those together. Good. Now you get in here. Let's see. All right. Keep going. Turn around. There you go. Hold those up together. Get them end to end because you know we got to do some. We got to do some adding up here because remember we got to do 34 feet. So this is like uh, we got. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30, 33, 36. Oh, man. Uh-oh. We got a problem, people. I have the stat sheet on lecture hall 137 in physics from Jay Doberke, the keeper of the lecture hall. This ceiling is only 32 feet high. This is not going to work. Uh, false start. We can't do this. Darn. Unless somebody want to drill a hole in the ceiling, can we do that? I don't think so. I think we'll be in trouble. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, volunteers. All right. The point is here, people, this is a highly impractical idea. And believe it or not, Torricelli tried this. And he figured out, well, I can't fit it in my house, so I'll put it outside the building. OK, well, what happened? So he's got this monstrous 34 feet tall pipe with water sitting outside of his house. What happened? Well, he lived in a gossipy Italian neighborhood. People were talking. His wife came to him. She said, Evangelista, we're in trouble. People don't like the way it looks. They're saying that we didn't go to the aesthetics board in the village and get a permit, and they are really ticked off. So Torricelli said, all right, stop. I'm going to take this down. Life will get better. Good. But Torricelli kept at it. He said, I'm not beaten yet. Back to the drawing board, like every good scientist. And Torricelli switched substances to mercury. Mercury is much better because, number one, it doesn't evaporate. So you don't have to worry about whether or not your barometer is showing loss of pressure because the water is evaporating. And mercury conveniently will hold up a column only about 30 inches high. So it was the perfect way to measure the pressure, the mercury barometer became an incredible tool. 
And we don't see these around very much because we're very aware nowadays of the toxic nature of mercury as a heavy metal. But this is what a real mercury barometer looks like. And your little tub of mercury is inside here, and your measuring tool is on the top of the column about 30 inches up. Really a, a thing of beauty, and still the most accurate way to measure pressure. But more commonly nowadays, we use this type of barometer. Many of you have seen these wall barometers. This is an aneroid barometer. It has a small chamber inside of it that's partially evacuated. And when the air pressure, the weight of the air, increases, it compresses the little um, aneroid chamber. And when the pressure decreases, the chamber can expand. And that expansion and contraction is measured by this little pointer that moves around on the dial and it gives you the pressure in inches of mercury or in millibars as you wish. Uh, an even cooler uh, version of this I have here is a recording barometer, what's known as a barograph. And this is a very old barograph, but there's the aneroid chamber, the nice metal thing, and it's kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine. It's hooked up to a lever, to another lever, to another lever, to another lever, and then that goes to a pen. And the pen is attached to a rotating drum that turns with the clock. How do you keep it going? You wind it up. It still ticks, it's amazing. And what happens if the ink runs out? Well, you got a little bottle of ink there to refill and replace the pen. And if the paper runs out, well, you better make sure that you got some stored somewhere nearby because you got to replace the paper so you can keep the record going. Sounds like a lot of maintenance, and it is. So what have we replaced it with? Well, we have electronic digital barometers nowadays, and they need maintenance too. Batteries run out, cows chew through wires, all kinds of stuff. It takes maintenance to have instruments. It's just part of the way it goes in the field of atmospheric science. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, there are thousands of weather stations around the world. Every single one of them at ground level has a barometer in it. Isn't that a waste of money? I mean, think about it. Average atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Why don't we just have one world barometer to measure that and save the rest of the money and buy brewer tickets or something, right? I mean, really, why not? Well, obviously, there's a flaw in my thinking here because there are small differences in the pressure from place to place. And small differences in pressure can have big consequences. Let me show you here. All right, I've got two tubes here. This one is filled with water that's colored blue. On, this would be on your right. And on the bottom, they're joined by a little tube with a valve. Now, what happens if I open the valve? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that the water begins to flow from the taller column over towards the smaller column. What's going on? The weight of the fluid at the bottom of this column is greater than the weight of the fluid at the bottom of this column. And so, therefore, there is a pressure difference, and it is trying to force the fluid from the taller column to the shorter column. And it doesn't matter which direction you work it. If we look at this one, now we've got the taller column here, the shorter column on your left, on your right, and the same thing is happening. The fluid flows through the tube from the taller column where the weight of the column is greater to the shorter column where the total weight of the column is smaller. This is motion that is driven by pressure difference. And people, this is an important, very important concept in the atmosphere and in any kinds of fluids. What is the movement of air? It's called wind. All wind is driven by pressure difference. We call pressure difference, we have a special name for it. Pressure difference causes what we call pressure gradient force. And all wind is driven by pressure gradient force. All wind is driven by pressure difference. That is so important, I want you all to say it. All wind is driven by pressure difference. Oh, you guys are incredible. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Now, not only that, but the stronger the pressure difference, the stronger the wind. And you know what? Every meteorologist in the world knows this. When you look at a weather map, oh, I love looking at weather maps. Did I ever tell you that? You know what? This is actually cool. This looks a lot like 
today's weather map at 7 o'clock this morning. We had this monstrous low pressure center only. It was right up over the Keweenaw Peninsula in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and it was an even deeper low than this, and it was causing a monstrous a lot of wind outside. Didn't you feel it? Yeah. That's because there was a lot of pressure difference. See on this map, these wiggly lines are called isobars. They're lines of constant pressure. The closer together the isobars, the faster the pressure changes over distance. So looking at this map, I'd say that people in southwestern Minnesota are really getting blown away, uh, whereas the wind is a lot lighter in southern Kansas and northern Oklahoma because the isobars are spread out. So it's amazing how we can put together this idea of pressure difference by looking at a weather map and just being able to realize how strong the winds probably are just by taking a glance at how tight together the isobars are packed. It is an amazing story. And I have to tell you that the barometer really, really is one of the landmark inventions in the history of science. And when you think about it, it's amazing to realize that what? Galileo invented the thermometer himself. His best student, Torricelli, invented the barometer. Two of the greatest inventions and tools in atmospheric science. Where would we be in predicting and measuring the weather without that? And yet, what do we remember Galileo for the most? The telescope, of course, but that's okay. I just hope that you go home knowing that Galileo did a few other things. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Sir Isaac Newton, our second scientist of the night. Let's talk about Newton. He was amazing. Uh, Newton lived in England, and he's very famous, of course, for, we all know, Newton's famous laws of motion. The first one is the law of inertia, which basically says a body at rest tends to remain at rest. A body in motion tends to remain in motion at a straight line, in a straight line unless an unbalanced force acts on it. His second law, which is closely related, is the famous relationship between acceleration and force. If you apply a force to a mass, it tends to accelerate in proportion to that mass. This is the famous F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. And I'm going to show you some very, very important ways that that can be applied before we're done here tonight. The third law, very interesting, is called the law of opposites. And on one hand, this seems the most intuitive to people. It basically says that for every action, there's an opposite reaction. Sounds pretty cool. But out of this law come three important, what we call conservation laws. Conservation of mass. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. Conservation of energy. And a very interesting one, I have it written on the board here, and very important to me, is the so-called conservation of angular momentum. Now what is angular momentum? Well, it's defined as momentum is mass times velocity. But if you have a mass moving at a velocity in a circle around an axis, if you multiply that by the distance from the axis, that gives you angular momentum. And Newton's famous conservation of angular momentum that comes from the law of opposites says that this must always be the same. Now, how many of you have been watching the Olympics? OK, so we've all, if you've seen figure skaters, I need a volunteer, a very a volunteer with a strong stomach. And this is the only volunteer opportunity that is for adults only. <laughs> OK, so a strong stomach adult, raise your hand. OK, we'll take you. Excellent. Come forward. All right, you are going to get a ride on Bart's Wheel of Misfortune. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> all right, so here's what I want you to do, first of all. Stand on the wheel. What, oh, stand on it? Oh, yes. I warned you. OK, so now here's what I want you to do. Put your arms out. Now, watch this. Now, I'm going to turn you a little bit. I won't turn you too fast. Okay. Oh, we do have Dramamine if you want no, some, though. Oh, no, OK, all right. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a spin. And I want you to slowly bring your arms in after having them out for a moment. Okay. All right, so I'm going to give you a little spin. All right, now bring your arms in. Now, you're moving faster. All right, every figure skater knows that. I'm going to stop you here. Just stay right there, though. Okay. Every figure skater knows this. What happened? When I gave her a spin, the mass was way out here. That was the distance out to the mass of her hand. When she brought her hands in, that distance from the axis center of rotation became smaller. If this becomes smaller, in order to keep this constant, the velocity has to go up. 
Something has to give is basically what the conservation law says, and it does. Another important part of the conservation law, and here's, let me give you this little bicycle wheel. Whoops. Hold this like so, straight out. Now, if I spin this bicycle tire, you stay put, because all the spin is in the horizontal direction. Now turn that bicycle tire vertically. Turn it, turn it. Now, look it, she's turning. Why is that? Because momentum, conservation of angular momentum. The momentum that was in the horizontal is being transferred into the vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens, we believe, in tornado formation. In a thunderstorm, the jet stream spins the air around in the horizontal, and then the thunderstorm updraft turns it vertically, and now we have spin about a vertical axis. All out of the conservation of angular momentum. Thank you very much for not getting seasick on me. All right, now, uh, boys and girls, I have to tell you, I teach math, and this is a very important part of the show for me, because I want to remind everyone that one of the great things that Newton did was that he invented calculus in the year 1665. He invented calculus because Newton was trying to describe his famous law of gravitation. Everybody knows the law of gra gravitation, right? What goes up must come down. But Newton was a mathematician. He said, I'm not just going to write this in words. I want to write it in the precise language of mathematics. So he sat down to start writing it down. And he said, darn, don't have any good math to write it in. Guess I'll have to invent some. So he invented calculus. <laughs> College students have hated him for centuries for coming up with such a thing. But it's a thing of beauty. Math. Math is the language of all science. Math is the universal language. And in case you haven't noticed, almost everybody you're going to hear from me about tonight was a mathematician first. So, so Newton invented calculus. And then he described his law of gravitation, which he published in his famous book, The Principia, in 1687. Now, you might have noticed he was figuring out this law of gravitation in 1665. And you might say, what have you been doing for the 22 years, Ike? I mean, come on. Publish or perish. You could get a lot of trouble and hold, lose your professorship today if you don't do that. Well, Newton was, one of the funny things about Isaac Newton is he was very, very nervous about people criticizing him. So he would figure out things, and then he would sit on them and be afraid to publish them. In fact, he almost didn't get credit for calculus because a, a German professor named Leibniz over in Germany came up with the idea shortly thereafter, and he did publish his work. Now, in the end of his life, Newton was knighted. That's why he's Sir Isaac Newton. He was elected to Parliament, and he was a very quiet man. In fact, he never spoke in Parliament, it seemed. And then one day, in the House of Commons, he raised his hand, and the whole chamber hushed. And everybody was like, all right, we're going to finally get to hear this great man speak. And Newton stood up, and he said, Excuse me, I'm feeling a draft. Would someone mind closing the window over there? <laughs> and he sat down and never spoke again. So, you know, that's just Sir Isaac Newton. All right, time for another sidebar. I want to tell you about the only non-mathematician in my array of scientists tonight, Alfred Nobel. He was a chemist, a Swedish chemist. And, of course, a lot of people know about Nobel because he invented dynamite in the year 1867. You know. Um, before that, his family was into explosives, not for war. They were into it for, you know, mining and construction and stuff like that. But uh, his family had several factories, and uh, one day one of his relatives was killed when there was an explosion at the factory because nitroglycerin was very unstable. Well, Nobel determined that he was going to fix that. So he figured out a way to stabilize it by mixing it with diatomaceous earth, and that's what we know as dynamite. Now, some of you are more familiar with dynamite became more and more stable as time went on because a new and improved substance called 246 trinitrotoluene was replacing it, uh, which most of you know is TNT. And a lot of people refer to that as dynamite, but it was not the same thing as what Nobel came up with. But you know what? I love things that explode, so why don't we have an explosion in honor of Alfred Nobel? Can I have a very brave volunteer? All right, let's see. How about you? Yeah, come on, come on up here. <laughs> now, I got to warn you, uh, for this uh, demonstration, got to put on these. OK, so put these on over your glasses. Good. And put these on over your ears. 
And uh, I'm going to do the. I'm going to do the same thing. The rest of you can, uh, you got about 30 seconds to flee if you don't like this. Um, so here we go. And uh, I'm going to take this balloon here, and I'm going to put this uh, unique and exotic gas that is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon in here, otherwise known as air. And <laughs> we'll put it in here, and we're going to fill it up. Now. What have I done here? I have put a very high pressure on the air inside the balloon. And the pressure outside the balloon is much less. So if I open it up, and if I release the air slowly, the pressure gradient force, the pressure difference from higher pressure to low pressure, will slowly equalize it. Wasn't very dramatic, was it? No. But now what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a special tool. This is called the detonator, OK? So you're going to take this detonator, and you're going to hold it like this. And I'm going to take this balloon, and I'm going to blow it up like this. Let's really get it big, yeah. All right. On a count of three. Three, two, one. Oh, they got me. Thank you very much. Awesome job. <laughs> All right, so what happened there? The reason that was so shocking was because we literally sent a shock wave through the audience by the sudden release of pressure. You know, what do you hear as sound? Those are vibrations in the air. And the vibrations cause your eardrum to vibrate, which is connected to your auditory nerve, which sends a message to your mind that says, wow, that was loud. So um, in this case, um, there was a sudden release, and it sent a pressure wave through the air that we all heard as that explosion. All right, so that was Alfred Nobel. And a few things about Nobel. Uh, he became very rich because he had factories all over the world. Uh, but when he died in his last will, he bequested 31 million Swedish kroner to establish the famous Nobel Prizes. By the way, if you're wondering, if you don't keep track of Swedish kroner in your spare time, uh, that's a cool $250 million, a quarter of a billion in American dollars. An amazing amount of money. And he established prizes for excellence in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, peace, and later in economics. But that was not until 1968, and that is technically not one of his original uh, Nobel Prizes. It's actually called the Prize for Economics in Memorial of Alfred Nobel. But it is awarded at the same time. And Alfred Nobel uh, did incredible stuff. All right. I want to show you a very important chemical reaction, actually a nuclear reaction. I need five volunteers. And I need the rest of you to have your pencils and paper ready. Because we're going to do some math here. What? You were told there was no math? Sorry. <laughs> We should have warned you at the beginning. All right, five volunteers. Six, yes, one, two, three, uh, four, and five. You guys, come on up here. All right, stand in a row. There we go. Good. All right, nice. All right, so we're going to start with you. We're going to give you a hydrogen atom, which has an atomic weight of 1.008. And you're going to hold up, no, no, no. He's going to hold up, the, you each go to hold up two placards. So hold up the H and hold up the plus sign right next to it. Right next to it. All right. So, no, here like this. Hold it, hold that and that. There we go. All right. So, H plus H, 1.008, plus, do you see the math problem building, folks? Okay. okay. Copy this down. H plus 1.008 plus, and now we're gonna do, we're gonna do what we call a fusion reaction. We got one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms here, right? All right, this is the fusion of hydrogen. Now, are there any nuclear physicists in the audience? Be honest. OK, I'm going to tell you, just so you know, I'm going to take a couple of shortcuts here in this fusion process. It's actually a three-step process. And there's weird stuff like neutrinos and positrons that I'm going to ignore because it's not important for my purposes. So please accept my apology in advance. Uh, if you have any complaints, PO Box 413 UWM. You can write to me later. All right, so everybody add those up. What do you come up with? 4.032. Excellent. 4.032. I trust your math. So that should equal one helium atom at 4.03. What? 
4.003, did somebody add wrong? This is a problem, people. Somebody took 0 0.029, and we are going to launch an investigation. That does it. Did you take the 4.029? He did it. You did? <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't smoke. I did. I did. Plus, you're not allowed to in here. I did. Did you take the, four point, the 0 0.029? Did you take the 0 0.029? All right. Everybody's in denial. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one person who can help us with this. The incomparable Albert Einstein. Let's see what Einstein can do to help us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Who was this guy, Albert Einstein? Albert Einstein was born in Germany and eventually came to the United States, died. He was on the uh, faculty at Princeton. There's a lot of bad press. A lot of people, you ever hear these rumors? People say, oh, he was no good at math. When he, We now know that was wrong. He was good at math. But he had some, he did have a few problems. You know, like a lot of people, you know, does this sound familiar? You know, like late teens, early 20s, couldn't figure out what he wanted to do. You know, he applied to university. He didn't get into the university he wanted to, so he was kind of ticked off, and he kind of sloughed around, and he got a job in the patent office in Switzerland, and he was sitting around, and in his spare time at night, he would work with equations and math. And what happened? Well, in the year 1905, people, Albert Einstein literally turned the world upside down. He published four papers. A paper is the summary of his findings a summary of his calculations. Four papers that changed the world forever. Let's look at his four papers. The first one was called, was one that described what we call the photoelectric effect. What is that? It basically says, you know, up until that time, there was a big argument in the scientific community about light. Some people, going back to Newton, said that light was a particle. Other people, like Christian Huygens, said light is a wave. And so this debate went on. Light is a particle. Light is a wave. Light is a particle. Light is a wave. So along comes Albert Einstein. And everybody's like, Albert Einstein, tell us, is light a particle or is light a wave? And Einstein said, the answer is yes. <laughs> because light is both like a particle and like a wave. Light behaves like a wave. You can measure its wavelength. You can measure its amplitude. You can measure its frequency. You can measure its speed, the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. You can also figure out its energy in particle packets that we call photons. Star Trek stole that word. They should not have done that. But anyway, yes, photons. So light had both particle-like properties and wave-like properties, and Einstein was able to describe them both in his paper on the photoelectric effect. Then he came up with this paper on Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the tendency of molecules to roll around each other in gases and fluids. And Einstein's thing, or paper on Brownian motion, really, what it really did was, up until that time, the idea of an atom was kind of considered a, a cute idea by a lot of scientists, but not really practical. But Einstein proved that the atom was here to stay, and that it was real, and there had to be such a thing as atoms. So that was a hugely important paper. Then he came up with this weird thing called special relativity, the idea that space and time can dilate and change. Oh my gosh, weird stuff. People couldn't believe it. And then finally, last but not least, he came up with this incredible paper about the equivalence of mass and energy. And ladies and gentlemen, this is where the 0 0.029 went. In Einstein's famous equation, energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Because this provides a description for how energy and mass can interchange. How energy can be converted to mass, how mass can be converted to energy. And the, the reaction that I showed you of four hydrogen atoms fusing into one helium atom goes on constantly on the sun. Every second, millions of tons of hydrogen are converted into helium. And in the process, energy is released. And that is what provides us the energy to live on our planet. So every time I wake up in the morning and I see the sun and I feel its warmth, I say, ah, E equals mc squared. There it is. 
in operation. So thank you, Albert Einstein, for doing that for us and giving us such incredible insight. All right, we're getting towards the end of my program. And yet, I have to tell you, this is my favorite part, because these are my solid gold scientists. I want to tell you the incredible story of the British scientist Lewis F. Richardson, who you might not be as familiar with. He was an incredible mathematician, uh, lived in England. And the thing is about Richardson is that in the year 1922, he became very interested in weather. And the idea that one might be able to predict weather, not just by calling his neighbor 100 miles away and figuring out how fast the clouds were moving and when they would get to him, but rather by precisely calculating the future weather based upon the present. And he published this incredible little booklet called Weather Prediction by Numerical Process in 1922. This was the beginning of the modern era of weather prediction. And how did he do it? How many of you have taken algebra? Be honest with me. OK, so in algebra, you learned that if you have two variables, like x and y, you can figure out what x and y are if you have two relationships, which we write in a thing that we call an equation. So if you have two equations and two unknowns, you have what's called a closed system. And you can solve exactly for those two variables. Well, the atmosphere is only a little bit more complicated. Instead of having two relationships, we have six. There are six relationships based on the laws of physics. And they can be written in six beautiful equations. And then we have six variables, pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind. Wait a minute. Can't you count, Bart? That's only four. I tricked you. Wind is actually three, north, south, east, west, up, down. Wind has three components. So it really is six. So if we have six equations at six variables, again, we have a closed system. And Richardson said, this is beautiful. We can solve it. That means that we should be able to solve by measuring the pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind right now. We should be able to figure it out by calculation at some future date. So we came up with these things called the primitive equations. Not because the cavemen used them. The cavemen didn't know about this. And you might look at this. You might say, all right, I just want you to know, I understand that not all of you have had calculus, but these are equations that are written in calculus. And I just want you to see what they look like. But these are actually described something that you already know a little bit about. These first three equations are really Newton's second law in disguise. Force equals mass times acceleration, describing the acceleration of the wind. North, south, east, west, and up, down. Three equations. This third one is what we call the conservation of mass. Again, all over again. This fourth one is the conservation of energy. And this last one is the conservation of moisture, which we describe by humidity. All right, sounds like a thing of beauty. Richards had an idea on how to do it. He said, I'm going to use computers. Oops. <laughs> They didn't have computers as we know them in 1922. This is a giant auditorium. And Richardson figured he needed 64,000 people, like you, with pencil and paper, to be sitting in this auditorium doing these calculations by hand, merrily away. And they needed to be kept in unison, kind of like an orchestra. So you would have this like conductor who sat up here in this central tower. And if somebody was doing their calculations a little too slow, he would shine a blue light on them. And if somebody was going a little too fast, he would shine a red light on them. And that way, they would keep everybody working at the same time. Well, this sounds really great, right? Only problem was they tried to make a forecast for two points in Central Europe. And it took six weeks to make the forecast for the next day. <laughs> Not good. Can you imagine the ratings that the local meteorologist would have on TV if he got on the TV at tonight at 10 o'clock and said, the forecast for tomorrow will be ready in uh, you know, mid-April? Uh, not going to work. All right. Obviously, this did not work. But I have to say, Lewis F. Richardson really was a game changer in coming up with this. It didn't, it didn't take hold right away. Uh, and then Richardson, I might add, was a man, a real man of peace. He was a Quaker. During World War I, uh, he served as a stretcher bearer on the battlefield. And later on, in the 1930s and 40s, 
he developed what he called the mathematical theory of war, where he proved mathematically that war was absolutely pointless. Not many people read his work, obviously, but too bad. All right. What Richardson could not envision in 1922 is what would happen only 28 years later. The ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, the granddaddy of the digital computer, arrived. And in 1950, a group of incredibly important and gifted mathematicians and atmospheric scientists were gathered in Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania, to see the running of the first computer-run weather forecast. And there were people in there, some of you who are mathematicians would be familiar with John von Neumann, who was a tremendously gifted mathematician and made great advances in game theory. Um, he also worked prominently on the Manhattan Project, developing the nuclear bomb during World War II. And then after the war, he became very interested in modeling uh, the atmosphere and weather prediction. And he and this group of mathematicians and scientists made the first computer-run weather forecasts in 1950. Now, the ENIAC was an incredible stove. They used to say that when they turned it on, that all the lights dimmed in Philadelphia. Because <laughs> it was just, you know, this incredible machine. It had 18,000 vacuum tubes. Do you know what a vacuum tube is? Here's a vacuum tube, people. Ever seen one of these? You know, when I grew up, these were in my TV set at home. My dad would take me down to the corner drugstore with, like, all of them, and we'd have to test them because they would burn out all the time. Okay, so the ENIAC has 18,000 of these. So you can imagine the maintenance crew that it takes to keep the thing going. And even though it was a digital computer, by today's standards, holy cow, was it slow. The ENIAC ran at 5,000 flops, which is basically 5,000 calculations per second. Now, today's modern computers that the National Center for Environmental Prediction has run at 213 teraflops, 213 trillion calculations per second. And in 2015, they just announced this a few months ago, the National Weather Service will go up to 2,000 teraflops, 2,000 trillion calculations per second. So obviously, the ENIAC was slow, and it still took three days to do the forecast for tomorrow. But <laughs> it was still, it was still, things were getting better, looking up. And by the mid-1960s, mid weather forecasts were being made on a routine basis using mathematical models run on a computer. And the weather forecaster who just looked out the window was already being left in the dust. My last scientist, and probably the one that's dearest to my heart, is Edward Lorenz. And you'll appreciate this in just a few moments. Um, Lorenz is considered the father of chaos theory. Now, very interesting. He was a Harvard-educated mathematician. But then he got called overseas to the war, and he became very interested in weather. So when he came back, he finished his PhD, only he decided to switch to meteorology. And he, was at, he did that at MIT, and then he stayed at MIT. And in 1963, he developed this thing called chaos theory, which was a highly mathematical uh, description. Well, first of all, what is chaos? A lot of people think chaos is disorder. Chaos is not disorder. Chaos is an order that we do not perceive. Now, kids, you cannot use that as an excuse with your parents. My boys try to do that to me all the time. Dad, my room doesn't need to be cleaning. It's just an order you don't perceive. No, <laughs> that is not the way it goes. So the thing is, so what did Lorenz do? Now, this is an interesting lesson. Lorenz came up with this chaos theory, and he published it since he was a meteorologist. He published it in a huge article in 1963 in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences. Problem. Hardly any meteorologist who read it could understand it. And the mathematicians who could have understood it didn't know where to look for it. I mean, in those days, we didn't have the internet. So you know, most mathematicians wouldn't like say, well, I don't have anything to do today. I'll walk down to the library and see what's in the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences this month. No, they didn't do that. So, his paper kind of went unnoticed. And then later in the 1960s, he published some more clarifications on it, and the word started to get out. He coined this term butterfly effect, which basically the heart and soul of his chaos theory was this idea that a small change or in the atmosphere in one place could affect a big change possibly in another. 
Let me illustrate this with an important concept called stability. I need two volunteers, two volunteers, please. All right, uh, let's see, right there, yes. And how about you? <laughs> Come on forward. Now, we're gonna do this with a salad bowl and a few tennis balls. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want one of you to stay over here and why don't you come over on this side behind, behind the table. Now I'm gonna take this ball and I'm gonna put it in here. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to come over here on this side and I want you to just give that ball a little gentle push. Now what he's gonna do, the push he's gonna give it is the fancy name we give for this is he's gonna apply a perturbation. Now see, he pushed it and what happens? The ball kinda goes back to where it started from, didn't it? Try it again, just give it a little push Okay, it rolls around and it kind of comes back to roughly where it started. This is what we call a stable system. If you give it a perturbation and you push it a little bit, it still kind of settles back to where it started from. You didn't have to go anywhere to get the ball back there, did you? No, you didn't have to go anywhere, no. Now, watch what happens if we turn this over and now we're gonna put this ball up here. Now, I want you to apply your perturbation gently and see what happens. No, no, don't, 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 don't touch it, don't touch it. Now, let it go, let's see if it comes back. <laughs> Is it gonna come back? No, it's not coming back. And if we sit here all night, it will not come back. So what happened there? What happened is that he applied a perturbation and this is an unstable system. Nothing you can do will get it to come back. This is chaos when the system does not behave well. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate your help very much. Let's put these back. Could you grab that tennis ball there for me? Thank you. All right, so this is the heart and soul of chaos theory. This idea that if you give a system that is chaotic, if it's disturbed a little bit, it goes out of control. Now, I think the best way for you to appreciate what a difference Edward Lorenz made in your life is to explain the fantastic advance that occurred in atmospheric weather prediction based on chaos theory. And the advancement is the beginning of what we call ensemble forecasting. I'm gonna show you how an ensemble works. Now watch this. Now, see this red box? This is gonna be a mathematical model of the atmosphere. In fact, I've even given it a real name. There is a model called the GFS, the, Gr the Global Forecasting System. Now, suppose that the temperature in Milwaukee is eight degrees. And we're gonna put that input temperature that we measured into the model and calculate the weather, the temperature for tomorrow. So we put in our eight degrees into the model. It chugs away and it gives us 20 degrees for a forecast. Now, we wanna see if the model is stable. So what do we do? We run it again, only this time we put in seven and we get out 19. And then we put in nine and we get out 21. So by making, we made some little changes basically in the input conditions and we still got pretty much the same forecast for the output. I don't know about you, but if my forecast numbers are just off by one degree, I consider that a pretty good forecast. So that's good. All right, now let's see. I feel good about trusting this model. It is stable. Now let's switch to another model the North American mesoscale model and see how it's doing on a particular day. So we're gonna put in the same input conditions, only our output conditions, whoa! These turn out to be pretty different. I don't know about you, one run gives me 14 degrees, when I put in eight, I get 24. When I put in nine, I get 35. I gotta tell you, 14 or 35 degrees is a big difference, people. I do not trust this model because that could be just an instrument error that could make a one degree difference in the temperature I put in the model. And if a little difference, just a small error in the measurements is gonna make such a huge difference in the forecast, this thing is out to lunch and I'm not trusting it. So this is the great gift of chaos theory to weather forecasting is that by using this idea of ensemble forecasting, ensemble forecasting, it's kind of like going to the doctor and asking for a second opinion. We run the model once with the actual conditions, and then we ask it for a second opinion with a slightly different one. And if we still get the same result, we feel really good about the diagnosis, right? If you go to three different doctors, they give you the same diagnosis, you feel pretty good. You go to three different doctors, they all tell you wildly different things, 
You know, one says you got the flu, one says you're all right, the other says you're going to die tomorrow. Wow, I don't know. I'm in bad shape. So this is what, this is what chaos theory did for weather forecasting. And it is incredible what a difference it has made. You should know that Lorenz received almost every possible award for his advances in science, especially in chaos theory, except for one, the Nobel Prize. Why? Everyone says that if there had been a Nobel Prize in meteorology or in mathematics, Lorenz would have run it. But think about it. There's a Nobel Prize in physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, peace, economics. Oops. No Nobel Prize in math or meteorology? Does somebody have 31 million spare Swedish kroners sitting around? We can start a Nobel Prize for those areas. Too bad. All right, finally in closing, I must tell you that Lorenz has some connections to Wisconsin. You should know that this man who passed away just a couple of years ago, Reed Bryson, uh, he founded the first meteorology department in the state of Wisconsin at UW-Madison in 1948. He was a tent mate of Ed Lorenz's on the island of Saipan during World War II. Professor John Young, emeritus professor at UW-Madison, he was one of Lorenz's graduate students, finished his PhD under Lorenz at MIT, came to Wisconsin. He was so highly regarded by Lorenz that when Lorenz went on a sabbatical in 1973-74, he said, I want John Young to come from Wisconsin and be the visiting professor in my place for that year. I had John Young for several courses in Madison. Brilliant professor, and he always spoke about Lorenz. Don Johnson, my major professor in Madison, consulted and worked with Lorenz in some of his work very frequently. And uh, finally, two scientists from UW-Milwaukee, Professor Paul Robert, distinguished professor of atmospheric science here at UWM, and he did his graduate work, some of his graduate work at MIT and had two major courses with Lorenz. And he said Lorenz changed his whole view of everything uh, in atmospheric physics. And finally, Professor Anastasio Sonis, who is also a distinguished professor in atmospheric science and did a ton of landmark work beginning in the late 1980s that helped to really bring Lorenz's chaos theory back into high visibility and eventually led to the use of it in ensemble forecasting beginning in 1992. Now, I just want to close by saying a word about my major professor, Don Johnson. He had such high regard for Lorenz. And I had a course with Don Johnson called The General Circulation of the Atmosphere. And in that course, we had to read this book, The Nature and Theory of the General Circulation of the Atmosphere by Edward Lorenz. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most complicated book I ever read in my life. And I had to read it from cover to cover. Every paragraph in this book is filled with equations and profound thoughts. And I have to tell you, I always thought this book is so amazing, and yet I would, we would sit in lectures from Don Johnson, and he would tell us stories about scientists. He would tell us stories about how he had lunch with Lorenz. And you know what? When I look back, I don't remember all that much sometimes about all the equations in that course, but I will always remember the stories about his, Don Johnson's lunches with Lorenz. And I'm indebted to him because that forever marked me in how I teach, because I really believe that history and science are intermarried. You know, scientists are people. I hope I made that point tonight. And people are interesting. Equations are nice, but scientists are ultimately people. And we should learn about the people and all the science that I think the math would be a lot more interesting to us, too. Thank you very much for being here tonight. God bless.